Okay, so good evening and welcome to TIFR's ASSET Colloquium today. Uh, ASSET uh, TIFR stands for Advances in Science, Engineering and Technology. Uh, this colloquia happens uh, the TIFR on Fridays at 4 p.m. Uh, in every week. And as you know, during the COVID, of course, uh, we have now moved to an online platform and uh, that is how you are here today on this, uh, on this Zoom platform as well as also on the, uh, on the YouTube, which is uh, being live streamed at this time. Um, and uh, the, the topic for today, as uh, you could see, uh, is on uh, the very important topic, uh, you know, from a completely societal uh, you know, context, uh, that is uh, the blind in STEM, uh, that is science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, a reality check. Uh, this particular talk is going to be given by a team uh, rather than a single speaker. Uh, from Xavier's Resource Center for the Visually Challenged. Uh, it stands for XRCVC, uh, led by Dr. Sam Tarapurwala. And uh, we also have two more colleagues from the same organization, Dr. Neha Trivedi, uh, who is uh, also from the same organization as I said, and also Ms. Poonam Devkar, uh, who is uh, the special educator at the XRCVC, working on STEM with students with blindness and low vision. Uh, before I go and introduce today's uh, speakers, I would like to thank Dr. A.P. Jairaman, uh, who probably some of you know, he is uh, our own DAE person to say, He's from the eighth batch of uh, BRC training school and served in BRC and DAE for about 40 years now. And after retirement, of course, he is one of the posts that he continues to uh, work with, he is uh, the chairperson of the National Center for Science Communications. And uh, he and his colleagues organize very, very useful programs for in the, in the science popularization and outreach space. Um, and then, uh, so let me uh, go down to kind of introduce uh, today's speakers. Uh, Dr. Sam Tarapurwala re uh, retired as associate professor and head of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of uh, St. Xavier College. Mumbai. Uh, he is currently the executive director of the Xavier's Resource Center for the Visually Challenged, as I already introduced, XRCVC, which he founded in 2003. He has been actively involved in you know, advocacy and awareness work in the field of social inclusion using applied research to address key access challenges for the persons with blindness and low vision. He has been uh, at the forefront of uh, work resulting in the amendment of the Copyright Act India 2000, in 2012 uh, and deployment of over 30,000 accessible ATMs in India and opening up of science education for blind and low vision students and so on. He is currently the vice president and chair of the Committee on Policy Intervention, DESI Forum of India. He was a member of the task force of our National Center for Universal Design and Barrier-Free Environment for Persons with Disabilities, subgroup on accessibility, mobility, research and innovation uh, to give inputs for the 12th five-year plan and many other you know, social causes and other activities. Uh, Dr. Neha Trivedi is a psychology graduate uh, from St. Xavier College with masters in medical and psychiatric social work from Tata Institute of Social Science. Um, she has over 14 years of experience in the disability sector, and she has been with the Xavier's Resource Center for the Visually Challenged, the Department for Students with Disabilities at St. Xavier College, Mumbai. So uh, with this introduction of uh, today's speakers, I would now hand over uh, the platform to the speakers. And uh, basically, Dr. Sam is going to start his lecture, followed by the other two speakers. Over to you, Sam. Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Sir. So, uh, thank you uh, very much, to, uh, Dr. Satya Naren and uh, Dr. Jairam, for that introduction, to, uh, which uh, you led on to and has resulted in this colloquium. You know, very often we, people ask us one simple question What is science all about? And what makes for a perfect scientist? 
is it the existence of all their uh, sense organs? Where does science really happen? Does it happen in the mind? Does it happen in the ears? Does it happen in the eyes? Does it happen on your fingertips? Does it happen in your nose? Where does it happen? And ultimately, the answer is, it's a thought process that drives science. If that be the case, what is the real ground level situation? Why are people who perhaps lack one faculty, one sense function, not represented that actively within the scientific fraternity? Is there something that the educational system is doing that is weeding out this immense pool of talent, this diverse mindset, which perhaps could add value to the blossoming of thought and to ever expanding creative inventions, innovations, discoveries, call them what you want. I'd like to share one thought from a chemist who had made a lot of work, effective work, but this chemist happened to be blind. So let's just look at that statement and ruminate over that thought. Well, what is chemistry all about? Or what is science all about? Is it that we have to perhaps pour something into a test tube and that makes a good chemist? Even a robot can do that. Is it that we have to record the data? Perhaps optical devices can visualize that uh, color change and even report it through computer simulation today. So then what is science? So then all about, it's about doing something with your mind. And yet the blind and low vision are generally weeded out on the count that perhaps they will not see or they will not be able to do science. So let's have a reality check about blindness and low vision. So how do we understand blindness and low vision? Uh, let's just, I'd like to share, uh, have an exercise with all of you with your, or without your permission anyway. I'm going to share a slide on which I'd like you to note down and send through the chat box to Dr. Satya Narayan. What do you see on that slide? In the chat box, you could write, uh, reply to everyone so that uh, we can have a look at the responses. Make your comment uh, in the chat box and send them to Dr. Satya Narayan, please. Well, uh, we Dr. Jai is not here. Yeah, Sam just. Is saying. there not? Anybody yeah, else? Can, you... can anybody else go deeper? Sandhya Ji says nothing else or accept something and we're getting these nothing comments. Would generally everybody agree with that? Okay, let me tell you if I were to be using some technology, what I would read. Let's move on to the next slide. Can you all now tell us what's written on the slide? Can you read that? Hello? Okay. <laughs> hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Well, theoretically, you can create a document, right, uh, Doctor Jackson? Uh, you can create a document where you can write in white.
on a white sheet and uh, a sighted person won't be able to read it. But if a blind person were using assistive technology, namely a screen reader, which we'll touch upon a little later in today's session, it would read it to me because I'm totally blind and I would be able to make sense of it. Why am I showing you this point? I'm showing you this basically because oftentimes we take what we see for granted that nothing is beyond what our eyes can see. But I don't need to talk to this august body of scientists who will say that the visible spectrum is just a drop in this vast spectrum where there's so many things that one can otherwise see through instrumentation. So let's ask ourselves this next question. How do the blind work? How do they function? Well, if I have to make the world accessible to me, or any blind person has to make the world accessible to them, we follow simple <laughs> Namely, we follow the principle of sensory substitution. I can't see. But the information has to reach my brain. So perhaps if one road does not work, I'll take the other. If I can't reach uh, destination A through road one, I may still reach destination A through road two. That is my ears or my fingertips or my sense of smell. So sensory substitution becomes very important. And therefore, perhaps extrapolating from here, if you had to work in the scientific arena, that same information, and perhaps uh, my colleague Neha will mention this later, oh, if you want to study the emergence of stars, well, some scientists use uh, different techniques. They use audio, and uh, perhaps uh, we don't have the time to demonstrate that, but you can actually study astronomy, not just through looking at things, but by listening to things. Well, so the sensory substitution and sensory supplementation, if I'm a low vision person, I will want things magnified, just as the scientists would look through the microscope and use smart optics to boost and boost and boost an image so that the naked eye can make sense of it. The person who is having low vision can also boost print, font, whatever, to be able to make sense of what is written or what is in the world around them. And for this, we use various technologies. If I have to read and write, how would I read and write? Well, when I started my student days and early in my teaching career, computers were not there. Today, we have that assistance. So I was purely dependent on Braille to start with. But thereafter, beyond Braille, one moved into computers where, well, I work with my monitor off. I don't need the monitor. And I can still listen into everything that my uh, screen reader is throwing up at me. We'll demonstrate that uh, in terms of a screen reader functioning. So you have Braille, you have screen readers, you have screen magnifiers. Well, beyond that, today, you don't even just need Braille on paper. You have technologies like refreshable Braille displays. Perhaps uh, we'll just bring up, uh, Neha, can we get a short video on that or you're showing on the graphic? We can show the video. So also before yeah, can I- Can a short video of it? Yes, sir. Yeah, so before I show you the video, I also wanted to uh, just clarify 
that what Dr. Sam was suggesting, and a lot of us misunderstand Braille. Uh, we think Braille is a language, but Braille is actually just a format. Uh, so Braille, as you can see demonstrated on the slide right now, is a combination of six dots. Uh, dot number one would make A, dot number one and two would make B, dot number one and four combined would make C. So this is great for a mathematics, right? It's like a puzzle. A different number of combination of dots make a different alphabet. And therefore, Braille can be written in any and every language. So it is not, uh, it is a format, it is not a language. And that's important to remember. And which is why Braille can also be written for numbers and Braille can also be written for all scientific notations. In fact, uh, the scientific code for Braille is called Nemet Braille and was invented by a blind mathematician because he found that there was lack of access in STEM for the blind. So uh, his name is Abraham Nemet and the code itself is named behind him called Nemet code. So I will also quickly show you a video on a newer technology for Braille. Traditionally, Braille was handwritten. Uh, now there is also electronic Braille called refreshable Braille. And I will just show you a short demo of the same. Uh, Puna, you are able to see my video? Yeah, okay. We, we can see. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, this is a small note-taking device where the Braille dots are refreshed. So they are going up and down. And you can hypothetically put a Word document inside this Braille note-taker. And the document will be converted into Braille for the blind user. The six keys that you are seeing on the note taker, which the person is punching, each denotes dot number one, two, and three, and four, five, and six. So the person can type in Braille, save a document, and from this SD card, that document would be available to be seen as a Word document. So that is what technology has done, and this is work of scientists. So the more scientists think of accessibility, the more accessible the world becomes. So, yes, I'm not sure. Two for IITs in India, uh, one in Mumbai and one in Delhi, both have thrown up uh, much cheaper refreshable Braille devices. And uh, interestingly, one of them has resulted in a startup in Mumbai. So, what used to cost around uh, 2.5 lakhs of rupees, uh, now can be made available to Indian users at around 30,000 rupees. And that's what science can also do. But uh, that's by the way. But it can also facilitate the active engagement of a young scientific inquiring mind of a person who is blind to note down things the way he or she would wish to and learn. So that's a refreshable Braille display. Uh, some other examples of access technology, you ha can have simple software on your PC which can boost the image. You can play with color contrast because remember there is no single low vision condition. You can have people who have tunnel vision, who have color specific conditions. Some people can have other eye conditions. And today you have a lot of software which tries to meet that low vision requirement. Some of the software is built into the operating systems like within the Mac or Windows OSs. In fact, your Android phone or your Apple phone also come with such software built in. Uh, the screen readers are also coming built into your phones today. And there are also screen readers which can actually read everything on your screen for your PC. Beyond that, if you have hard uh, copy, you can also use yeah. handheld video magazines. So a image of those as well coming up on your screen. Now, we've taken you so far, we will be taking you further into the world of visuals, graphics, and so on. But I'd like to just press the pause button a bit here. And uh, in case anybody would like to 
seek any clarifications or want to reflect on what we have spoken about so far. If, uh, also, Sam, before we do that, can I just do a quick demo of the screen reader? Sure, sure. Uh, so what Dr. Sam told you about is that as far as reading options, for, because a big question in the, in the mind of a lot of sighted is if the blind get into STEM, how are they going to do all the research work? So we believe that because our writing and reading is so sight dependent, we think a person with blindness would only be doing audio learning. And that is not true. So uh, what we are trying to show you in this first section is how a blind person would do their own independent reading and writing. So one option was Braille. The other option for a low vision person is screen magnifier. And the third option, which is the computer-based option for a totally blind person, is what is called a screen well, reading just, software. Okay. Oh, just F this PC, this PC, one of 76. So as you can hear the sound, uh, it is telling me this PC, one of 76 which means that my cursor focuses on the PC and there are, it is first of the 76 items on my desktop. English Lit 2 of 76. SWD data 2020 minus 2021 3 of 76. Network 4 of 76. So as you can see, the screen reading software is nothing else but something that will read aloud everything that where the cursor position will be. Desk now, if I open a document, new, new my my desktop list at T F T test seventy test Microsoft Word Microsoft Word document edit multi line page one section W E L O M E welcome. So as I typed, it's reading aloud, and when I finish typing, it will read aloud the entire thing for me. Now, if you'll also notice a slight, if, if you can tell me what the difference is. W, 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 W. So as you realize, there is a slight pitch difference. So capitalization, formatting, everything that's visual on the computer is accessible to a person with blindness through the screen reader. The screen reader would therefore be used by a blind person to operate the entire computer be it writing, be it internet, be it whatever, all our functions, right? It is only converting something that's visual into sound. Welcome, www. So I'm going to now uh, no, pause. No, no, and the, and the X, F, what, F, o, o. So when things are coming on the chat box, Sam was able to read it because he uses a screen reader on his mobile phone, right? And the advantage of the screen reader is that how the inaccessible part, which is color which was not visible, that is still accessible to a screen reading program. So different people would access this differently. So yeah, I think with that, we could uh, take a pause and ask if there are any questions to be asked as of now till whatever has been presented. So, Satya Narayan, if you can uh, push up some questions. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, uh, I think, uh, so any of you who are on the, the screen, uh, on the Zoom, uh, if you want to ask at this moment a few questions, of course, uh, it's going to be followed by uh, uh, some other part by uh, Dr. Neha and others. But at this moment, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, uh, you can ask right now, both on the Zoom as well as on the YouTube. YouTube, of course, the users, uh, the participants have to type in. Okay, and perhaps if there aren't any queries right now, uh, we could go ahead with the session. And uh, uh, one, we'll... uh, uh, Dr. Neha, I have uh, uh, sometime back, uh, you know, Sam said about, for example, in the context of astronomy, uh, he yeah. said it's not uh, just, you know, let us say seeing, but also hearing. Uh, yes. Uh, it, it comes uh, at a time when... Uh, Incidentally, you actually hear the shape of uh, the gravitational waves and so on. I mean, that just uh, just a side comment. But how does this actual observations happen by hearing in general? Yeah. So, in fact, we are just going to show you the technology here is sonification. 
so our next section when we are looking at how visuals and graphics get accessed by people with disabilities uh, we will be demonstrating that technology to you oh okay so you are going to show yeah 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 okay uh, there is a question uh, from youtube uh, by prajakta power uh, right. are these technologies commonly available to the blind students in india Yes, the good yes, news is it. Yes. In yeah. fact, uh, the screen readers are now even available within Indian languages, which is a great boon. Plus, some of the screen readers are now, uh, you know, being developed as open source. So, when they first came out in India, they were pretty expensive. Today, uh, you have uh, certain open source developments like uh, non-visual desktop access. It's called NVDA, which <laughs> is available to your client. And you can put some better text-to-speech devices on them for just a few thousand rupees. So these screen readers are also there on your phones as built-in, uh, out of the box. Whether I have my Android phone or I have my iOS uh, device, whether and I can even choose my language. Many Indian languages are supported. So that's the beauty of it today. as compared to say 20 years ago yeah but if i may supplement that the beauty of it as we'll share with you in a little later slide is science was being learned by the blind even when there was no mm. technology and uh, you know we have people who you know with plain braille have managed to uh, study science as well so that that's why we come keep coming back to that idea that it's a matter of aptitude and the methods get figured out by the person uh that neha another question from uh, zoom uh, this is yes. by uh, miss mamta joshi how can a blind person type on a keyboard uh, is it a special one yeah so in fact i wanted to address this earlier uh, all of us who do touch typing don't look at our keyboard right uh, so our students with blindness learn touch typing from the beginning and if you notice on all our keys Uh, on all our keyboards on f and j you will find a little bit of a raised dot uh that's the universal design of design thinking right so it allow f and j become your orientation keys and touch typing is taught to blind child, child uh, students keeping f and j as your orientation key so uh it's completely so th there is no special keyboard they use the same keyboard and they learn touch typing just as any sighted person would learn touch typing uh another question from uh, professor ravi manchanda uh, uh it's, a, it's not a, a question but actually a, a nice piece of information uh it says i met uh, yuma dikok i hope i pronounce the name properly who won 2019 human prize he wrote a fantastic software for astronomy uh, dr manchanda is an astronomer he is yes. blind astrophysicist rather sorry He is blind, but a great AI programmer. Uh, so, okay, the name should be read as Holman. Right? Sorry, I. Uh, it's uh, there is a correction down there. Okay, it's called Holman. Right. Sure. So this is a kind of a nice piece of information. Yes. Uh, so okay. So, so the screen reading software that we demonstrated to you, uh, that itself is developed by blind programmers. So there are lots and lots of blind programmers and uh, AI people. because when technology streams opened up uh the the engineering spaces especially software engineering was far more uh, accessible than some of the other pure sciences in terms of mindset of people in these spaces also uh so a lot of uh, uh software engineers were just more open to experimenting and looking at building up accessibility so today in fact there is a uh, there is an organization called iSTEM that's run which is a group of people with blindness running an organization that's working on stem access and there are lots of people like that like hobbies whose quote we shared uh, there are astrophysicists there are chemists and we'll share those life stories with you in a bit so i think maybe we can pause here and get into the next section if that's okay because of yeah sure short of yeah sure sure yeah sure uh so what we want to look at and this is sort of helping you over, so reading and writing is something maybe some of you might be familiar with but the biggest block that comes in people's mindset when they think of blind and science is as sighted people uh one is used to looking at science very visually 
and we really wonder how the visual element of science can ever be translated either through sound or through touch and we have our largest doubts related to that so we just want to show you how the blind access the visual world right so there are three or four key ways in which the blind access the visual world one is what is called tactile diagrams we have a scientific diagram and the same diagram can be translated into a diagram which can be felt through touch i will just show you also while the images are 2d flat i just want to show you a real diagram that we do for one of our students who is studying chemistry at st xavier's college and if you can see this diagram which i have printed this is a botany diagram it is raised so as a result the student will feel the diagram and understand what the image is now a instant reaction to something like this might be wow this requires an extra sense but there is nothing wow about it because this is the primary way through which a blind person accesses information so they tend to use their touch more therefore they might have increased tactile sense it's not a sixth sense at all but their source of information is touch so tactile diagrams becomes a very very effective way through which students with blindness and professionals access visual information the other method is through models now a lot of these are mainstream models and mainstream models that are more tactile so if you can see this is a, a cell model but different parts of the cell are highlighted through touch similarly this is a periodic table model and what is flat the entire table has been raised through a 3d model to help the blind person understand the layering so there are lots of these models that get used you might also wonder this is for something that a blind student will study but what about a blind person or a professional wanting to do their own drawing work can they do their own drawing work and we have these tactile drawing instruments which i would like to demonstrate to you this is a plain paper i have put it on a silicon red rubber mat and i'm using a drawing tool this tool you know how you and me will draw with a pencil and we can see it a blind person if you can see on the demo here as i put this tool down on the on the paper a tactile mark is made now you may not be able to visually see it but you will be able to feel it so a blind person would use a tool like this to do their own drawing work provided they gotten training in it and a lot of the awareness work that we also do is we train people with blindness also in doing touch tactile drawing and using tactile drawing So this is a tactile drawing tool that gets used by people with blindness to do their own visual drawing so whether it is physics diagrams or chemistry diagrams we or economics diagrams and charts a blind person could draw them uh when it comes to graphs right and a lot of scientific data gets represented graphically uh it's important to remember the purpose of graphical representation graph graphs are nothing else but pure data presented visually for visual users it need not always be presented visually so if i am not a visual learner i don't need to present my data visually uh however if i do want to there are alternatives so in order to understand graphs we use what is called this braille graph paper that is shown on the image right now a blind student would plot a graph through using tactile markers these are called wiki sticks so you can stick them on the graph paper if you were studying a diagram it would again become a tactile diagram for you and over and above this there are also now electronic accessible solutions for both drawing diagrams drawing graphs and submitting them uh the calculators there are scientific calculators and regular calculators also have audio versions of them available so any scientists needing to work with calculators who's blind would use audiographing solutions so i'm going to at this point request my colleague poonam to show you both the software solution for drawing graphs and accessing them through audio which is the sonification system that we were talking about earlier and how physical calculators also get ac made accessible through audio so over to you poonam thank you neha Uh, 
we are going to see like neha say there are audio reading like uh, there are physical graph options there are options for a person to plot graphs either on computer software or they can have a hard device on which they can plot their graphs when it comes to plotting graphs using a software there is a software which is desmos which allows a person to in uh, type any expression or insert zoom the host has asked you to start your video dot or uh, insert Medi any data in a tabular form and plot a graph of that i will be demoing how to plot a graph of any expression so here i have started the uh, desmos Website. I will be typing Demo Google Chrome. Expression which I want to plot. For example, if I want to plot a graph of uh, example which is x plus y equals to two. X plus y equals two. Two. X plus Y equals two has graph. While typing X plus Y equals to two, the screen reader announced me what I have typed, and after finishing typing, it also announced what that there is a graph on the screen. When I want to see what that graph actually is, I will audio trace the graph, which will give me a sonification for that graph. Graph paper showing H playing graph. There was a ting sound, which which changed its its pitch while it was going downwards. Like this, the blind student will understand that the graph is going downwards, and there is uh, some gra graph plotted on the screen. If the person wants to navigate through all the points, those are there on the graph. They can navigate through uh, using arrow keys. Zero at x, two y. Zero. So points are based on the graph. If I want to see what is it, I can go for the change or how the changes when the graph goes upwards. Audio trace of expression x dash one. Equals two, two. So x minus y equals two. You need something on both sides of the equal symbol. X minus y equals two. Expression three. Hello. Go bend down. Yes, just a second. Your screen is frozen for a second. So can you just go to x minus two is equal to two and just do the audio sonification? Expression. Graph paper showing H playing graph. The pitch on this when the point touches to when it intersects with the x-axis and y-axis. If I go along with the arrow keys, listen to the difference that it gives while the notification changes at x-axis and y-axis. It gives a water drop-like sound when it uh, intersects the axis. And it also X. announces what are the points available on the graph. X. This One is point. how a student will plot the graphs. And when it comes to sharing these graphs, they can export. Show show thumbnail there video. There are options to audio trace off demo uh, there are video content window. Share your graph. Graphs. The student can either share the link of the graph. Or print it directly as a submission, or export it as an image and attach it in any document that they want to work on. This is how they would do it with softwares. There are hardware devices which functions similarly and can be used with uh, for plotting graphs, which I will be demoing. Exit NVD. There are talking devices which a blind student can use for many of the uh, 
lab related work as well one among among that is scientific calculator scientific calculator how it it would work if you if we could see the demo of how the person is using this calculator 2 plus 5 equal 7 okay so if you didn't hear that then what you can do is you can hit the repeat 7 7 the student can type their expressions get answers to the expressions and the answer is also read out to the person this is what the calculation comes doing scientific calculation there are advanced calculators which can be used for plotting graphs or do any calculation that a sighted student would do as a part of their science or physics or any other science related subjects Like how we saw a time it work it gave us a solution that the device also has the feature to give solidification of the uh, graph that is plotted on the calculator and it also allows us to see what are the points plotted on the graph etc this is how a blind student would access all the scientific calculations mm -hmm. or plot all the graphs uh, in case they want to plot any graph or submit their graphs to the instructor thank you over to me ah uh, yeah so as uh, punam was trying to demonstrate uh, it would the top the graphing solutions can exist at multiple levels so just to recap uh, we've looked at how a blind person would read and write they would either use braille or screen readers or screen magnifiers depending on their preference as also their uh, level of vision with regards to accessing graphics they would either use tactile diagrams or models or software solutions uh, for calculators there are audio calculators available and if you sort of look at all the solutions you've seen so far it's really not rocket science it's as what dr sam told you initially the two fundamental principles operating here are sensory substitution and multi sensory approach i can replace my non functioning sense with my functioning sense i can either replace it with my one working sense or with multiple working senses so the only thing that's not working for a person with blindness is their eyesight no point is their imagination their intellect or their capacity to visualize getting affected because their camera of their body is not working they will be using their touch as their camera they would be using other senses as their camera to seek in information and to process it and make meaning of it so coming to the very important section of you know you might still as researchers uh, feel all this is fine but what about lab work uh, how is a blind person ever going to be able to practice in labs that are required to do scientific research so whilst we don't have too much time we wanted to flag some of the key solutions that blind scientists across the world use and successfully participate in laboratories so very simple access to the laboratory is done through using of their cane or smart cane to understand orientation workstations right uh, it's always good for the the part that the blind scientist has to be careful about is things spilling over so what people recommend and use are fixed workstations with clear tactile markings around so simple things like using of trays to put instruments go a long way in helping create accessibility in labs um a lot of the material that needs to be used gets given tactile marking so what you see on your screen right now is braille tactile marking for a beaker or even a simple marking like a rubber band around the beaker to distinguish it from another beaker a very simple solution that our students use is instead of putting all the solutions in the same beaker 
they will put solutions in containers with different shapes and therefore they will know that what i have put in a beaker is this what i have put in a test tube is this and therefore they can interchangeably use without needing labels uh you can also put simple braille labels on instruments to help you distinguish what you would have otherwise distinguished through the use of vision uh measuring instruments right whether it is from pipettes to spring balances all of them can be given tactile markings today there are a lot of fixed volume pipettes that are available in the market which are better used for all advanced science science and well equipped scientific labs they are already using fixed volume pipettes and that this is what our students are also using when it comes to biological sciences and dissection uh we do very simple in house solutions like what you see on your screen which is a guide for a slide guide right so we have created a guide frame and cut off the part where the student would have to put the slide to ensure that the student slide remains in a fixed position we have given a tactile marking on the frame that will allow the student to put their sample in the center of the slide it is very very it might look very simple but it's the simple that's very very effective so we would use this to create slides dissection is a tactile skill a lot of times as sighted scientists we forget that when we are dissecting something we can't always see it your sense of touch and the luck of picking up a very minute sample is as good or bad as that of a blind scientist using their sense of touch for all you may know because this blind scientist is using their sense of touch more they will be able to pick out a minute part much more better how will they study this you are not able to see this with your naked eye and nor is a blind scientist seeing this with their naked eye your solution to seeing this is putting it under a microscope and magnifying the blind scientist solution to this is creating an enlarged tactile diagram of what you see under the microscope so the method of accessing the invisible changes but we need to remember that as scientists most of us are studying the invisible and therefore lack of sight should really not become a hindrance to studying the invisible the journal work writing work publishing work happens the same way using screen readers and braille that we've already shown you and the few things which today for whom technology still does not exist which are visual reading on physics instruments for example uh, a lab assistant gets used to read out the visual readings we need to understand that use of a lab assistant will soon get replaced with ai for most of us so if a lab assistant is being used to create access it does not need to be seen in that framework of dependence because it is not it is simply a human person being doing what a robot or an ai is going to do in the future and here also lies the scope of creating a lot of innovative access technologies right so what exists today can become much more accessible in the future and that is what we'd like to conclude with essentially with a few key questions that do all researchers do hands on work and do you need to always be doing something to its minutest point to be able to guide knowledge in the field of study and these are some real life experiences and this is what i'd really like to highlight to show to you that science has existed before assistive technologies existed we have people who are blind who have been in the science stream since the 1750s and perhaps even more the earlier ones may not be documented so we have somebody called francois huber who specialized in honey bees and he did all his observations through using sighted assistants however the knowledge was his we have jacob jacob bolotin who was the first totally blind physician who studied from the chicago medical school way back in the 1888 abraham nemeth who i spoke about was a blind mathematician he and he actually invented the braille math code because he found the existing braille code limiting to study advanced science uh currently we have at uc davis uh this person called dr girard veremji he's a marine biologist and he studies shells and what he has found is 
his sense of touch enables him to do discoveries which a lot of sighted people are able to miss because they don't see it and even he can't see it but he's able to feel them better so that there right because he is a blind scientist he's able to contribute to knowledge which would have otherwise got missed out vanda diaz is actually a blind astronomer who uses sound to study visual data through sonification and what her research work has shown and he, she currently works with the south african astronomical Ast observatory uh, i would really encourage you all to see her ted talk because of lack of time we couldn't show it to you here her use of sound has revealed patterns in astronomy science which she is studying which were otherwise getting missed by the visual graphic tools that were used in astronomy so i want to highlight this that creating access and having people with disabilities as scientists opens up data which otherwise the sighted scientists are missing out because the method of use is different kent colors is an optical physicist who's blind and who's been working at the seti institute in california for many many years uh the unfortunate story in this slide is all of these are out of india researchers does that mean that indian blind people are not scientists in fact in india we have the maximum scientists and scientific knowledge and uh, skill and yet amongst our people with disabilities because of our limiting laws our talent has not been coming in so uh, what sign uh, what sam told you earlier we've been actively working with scientific institutes in india to make them more accessible to let people with disabilities come in and we've had successful examples over the last 5 to 6 years kartik who's a computer scientist now works with microsoft unfortunately had to go to stanford to study because our laws did not permit him to went ahead and became a successful computer scientist uh, kritika purohit is a totally blind student who became a physiotherapist very much in bombay and now runs a clinic in virar for whom we had to go to high court to change rules and this is where we would love to see your participation as the community to open up your mindset to see a scientific temper and capacity a matter of intellect why do why should we let physical disability come in its way to pursue this uh we have never really insisted that you must write with your right hand or write with your left hand correct so why should we insist that science should only be done through sight and as scientists the more data types that we can build in the more scope we have for invention and discoveries so we would really love to encourage all of you to question your individual ideas on this to not only encourage more individual careers in the field of science but also permit greater scientific discoveries because the world has shown that inclusion not only allows to create access for individual careers but is perhaps a great path to greater scientific knowledge So with that we'd like to pause we would love to encourage you to be part of this journey collaborate with us and connect with us and see how we can make TIFR for example a space for great people with disabilities coming in and becoming scientists and joining in this journey so thank you very much for having us here and we'd leave it over to the question answer and the moderator thank you look forward to questions okay uh Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sam, uh, Dr. Neha, and Poonam. Uh, I must say uh, that what you told us today is something quite a uh, lot of new things. Uh, I'm sure we uh, didn't know many aspects of what you actually showed and demonstrated. Of course, the uh, the part that you really showed on the last few slides are something which uh, will we will go with, uh, you know, after this talk. And that I think that is something which will uh, come with us this day. These these particular thoughts uh, but what uh, i would say you know the the same asset forum on which uh, you have been talking uh, we also kind of hosted quite a few talks on related to this subject uh, uh, and i must say all of these have been bringing us something about the need for where you know we can uh, there is a lot of scope where uh, there is a mutual scope for let us say collaborative work and also bringing Uh, the aspects that you talked about you know particularly saying that how uh, people who are visually challenged can actually go and do professional sciences so this is i think that 
that kind of a statement that we are really impressed upon with your uh, with talk here. And I also recall recently, some time back, we had one talk by Dr. Balakrishnan from IIT Delhi, who actually, uh, uh, whom I met in some IEEE domain, and he gave a wonderful talk in TIFR on, of course, you must be kind of knowing this so-called smart cane. And in fact, he just was, awarded a Google award. Google award, yes. Uh, just came out recently, today. Fantastic. I mean, it is something which I think are very inspiring examples. Yours is absolutely inspiring. Not only that, you the way you are actually, uh, you know, doing a, a what I can call activism in, with the Indian system in trying to kind of, you know, uh, come out of this stereotyping and things like that is something I think which will go a long way in the community to come. Uh, so with that slightly longish uh, summary, I would like now uh, to uh, encourage uh, the participants to ask their questions. Uh, we have one here um, already on Zoom by Somin. Uh, what was the law that prevented the computer scientists to work in India or was it uh, kind of residue? Yeah, so the barrier here is our entrance examinations. Um, with, with great uh, heavy heart, if I may say, um, our rules related to appearing for entrance exams, uh, for example, in physiotherapy, uh, the rules four years ago said that a blind person could not even appear for the entrance exam. Uh, our IIT exams have rules that still don't provide alternative questions to visual questions, which is an international standard for competitive exams. So the barrier is at the entry point. Uh, unless until the examination rules become act so I remember when we said opening up of the sciences <clears throat> of Kartik, uh, when we approached the CBSE board that time, uh, the board did not have any rules formulated for a blind person being able to do practical exams. And as a result, any institute he would approach, he would say that we can't admit you because we don't know how to test you. And whatever we like, India is a very test driven country. So if I can't examine you, then I can't teach you. Uh, luckily, at that point, the CBSE board was very open and we created rules for how to conduct practical examinations and after which we have, we've seen over the last five years, how many more blind students are doing 11-12 science. So, because they were not allowed to do 11-12 science, they automatically could not apply for higher sciences. So, it was a chicken and an egg situation. Uh, so, we've changed rules at the 12th standard level, at the HSC board, at the CBSE board, and now we are seeing more people take up engineering courses and other courses in India. So that was the issue. Okay. Um, we have another uh, question from Mamta Joshi. How do people who lose their vision much later in life uh, cope with it and unlearn their training as a person with a sight earlier? Sam, you want to take that? Well, uh, there are different uh, situations and the adjustment situation depends from person to person, very honestly. Some are able to make the transition. The initial period is very, very critical in terms of uh, mindset and the support uh, ecosystem around the individual. If that is in place and it's effectively managed, we are able to see effective transition. However, most of uh, such persons are not able to take to Braille because finger sensitivity is not uh, so sh uh, sharp at that stage. However, today, thanks to computers uh, and the fact that most people would have known the use of uh, the keyboard and computers, we work with a lot of people who are late blind and we are able to fast track them in terms of learning the screen reader and acquiring the basic skills. The screen reader basically follows one principle. Uh, you can't use the mouse. I don't see where the mouse is, so I can't use the mouse. So everything is uh, mapped through the keyboard in terms of uh, shortcut keys. So once one learns that, the uh, key uh, computer functionality is facilitated. It's a question. The next question comes in terms of orientation and mobility. Once an individual has decided that he or she wishes to actually 
become uh, independent, I would say 90% of the battle is won. The rest is a question of training and orientation. It takes a little time, but it's doable. And this can happen to somebody in the teens, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. The older you get, the more difficult it is in terms of getting in all your skills. But uh, then the workarounds that may be needed would be less because occupationally one may not need to get the person to adjust. So it's a question of basically just learning basic assistive technologies. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from Sonal Kathyal. Uh, if someone would like to pursue research in this field, can you suggest some sources of funding? So I wouldn't know many, but I know DHT does have grants uh, in this area, and there are other grants that can be made available. There are some awards uh, that can come through in terms of inclusion. So there are different avenues. Yeah, I think someone. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, saying, oh, you, you, yeah, okay, yeah. you posted uh, this kind of review of the blind astronomer because mm -hmm. she puts it very, very well, and that sonification she actually demonstrated demonstrates that software in the TED talk. It's about a 12 minute talk. I would really encourage all of you to see it, it would be really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so uh, this other speaker I was talking to you about uh, on this subject is Sri Anupam Chakraborty, who is the Secretary right. of Blind Persons Association, Kolkata. Uh, he yeah. spoke on the computerized Braille press project. Uh, and also, of course, I talked to you about uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, Professor Balakrishnan. Um, yeah. So if there are any more questions, uh, please either raise your hand or maybe type in in the chat, please. Okay, uh, I think uh, there are no more questions. So sure. uh, I would like to then thank all of you, uh, Dr. Sam, Dr. Neha, Srivedi, and also Poonam, uh, for not only talking something which is uh, obviously uh, we didn't even know that there are such a possibilities given the current technology and uh, the tools so that one could actually pursue things way beyond what a person with visually challenged person can actually pursue as a professional. Uh, you know, career and uh, some of the examples are really inspiring, but much beyond the message that you left for all of us in terms of uh, looking at this possibility of able to kind of contribute to this and I think collaborate with you. I think that is a bigger message of today's colloquium. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all of all three of you and uh, wish you all the best for your future endeavors in terms of enabling. Uh, I think uh, what uh, Sam mentioned in the in the beginning. Maybe uh, unknowingly or uh, whatever, uh, we are just missing to tap this large pool of potentially, equally potentially potential people by probably not providing uh, some opportunities. And what is even more uh, unfortunate is uh, some very archival kind of you know rules coming up and saying that this is allowed, this is not allowed, and so on. I hope your your active uh, you know efforts will kind of make uh, the path for others to follow more easier. Uh, with that, uh, from all of you at TIFR, we would like to thank you for being on uh, call with us and able to share your nice examples uh, of uh, the success stories. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. And I think to us, uh, being invited for forums like these are an uh, indicator of how things are moving forward because the scientific community is already talking about accessibility and that's great. So yeah, thank you yeah. so much for having us. Yeah, once again, I started with uh, thanking Dr. Jairaman, uh, but uh, once again, let me thank him as well uh, because of whom uh, this talk has been possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye, yeah, take care. <laughs>